gotten through by that time. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Um, so what we now want to do is a particular example. I want to show you how we calculate in almost the simplest possible example and one for which uh, Alphane, effectively Alphane was awarded the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering Alphane waves, and this is a, a part of that, you might say. So the question we want to address is we're going to use Maxwell's equations and we need some fluid description. And in particular, we're going to use what will turn out to be the simplest possible description. But what we want to talk about is a perpendicular, uh, it turns out, a perpendicular plasma dielectric constant in a low frequency limit. It's sort of a, a very important uh, example. And what do I mean by low frequency? Well, low frequency compared to the cyclotron frequency, so the particles can gyrate around the field line quite easily. Low frequency limit. And this is, uh, again, a pretty important example. Um, to do this, we need to recall the polarization drift. Polarization drift. And remember, the polarization drift was due to an oscillating E cross B velocity. So it was that the polarization drift was equal to M over QB naught squared uh, times B naught cross D V E cross B drift DT. Or we wrote it 1 over the cyclotron frequency d by dt of e naught perpendicular divided by b naught scalar magnitude. So the idea, so this is effectively going to allow us then to have a very simple description uh, of a plasma. Namely, we're going to say that if I have an oscillating electric field, that will cause a polarization current, which will be the sum over NQ times this V polarization. So this sum is over particles. Now, what's special about this polarization drift, and is very interesting, is that for all of the ions, it's exactly the same. Because remember the electric field, that doesn't, does, doesn't depend on the char or details of where the particle is. Oh, well, it's where the particle is. But I mean, uh, at any given position, I got a bunch of particles with certain density. And at that position, as long as I have small armor radius, I should say. Maybe I should say that. Yeah, we should say this is also in the limit k per rho is small compared to 1 for the same reason before that I can't have too big a um, um, char or what do you call it, finite armor radius effects. But the idea is that all ions within some small unit volume, okay, which, yeah, make myself a pillbox here. In some unit volume, all the ions in that unit volume uh, will all have the same polarization drift. So the current that I get, because I have a varying E cross, varying electric field, hence time varying electric E cross B velocity, all of them will be reacting the same and all electrons will be reacting the same. Now, there is a difference that maybe we have, you know, the cyclotron frequency, QB over M, is surely different for electrons and ions. So I have to add up what happens with N sub E, Q sub E, V polarization electrons, plus uh, N sub I, Q sub I, V polarization ions. So I have to add two species together. Um, but how, let's see, remember from quasi-neutrality, I need to have Ne is approximately Ni, right? How about the charge on the electrons and ions? Well, they might differ by the, you know, Zi, but let's consider protons or something like that. So roughly speaking, the magnitude of NeQe and NeQi have to be about equal. 
How about the polarization drift of the electrons and the ions? Well, the polarization drift is d by dt of electric field over B. Electrons and ions both experience the same electric field. But the polarization drift, it tells us here, is 1 over the cyclotron frequency. And since omega C E is much greater than omega C I, then 1 over omega C E for the electron polarization drift will be much less than 1 over omega C I. By the way, how big is this much less than in that case? Well, it's QB over M. Q is about the same, B is the same, so it's the mass ratio. So this is a good one. You know, this is 1 over 1,836, okay? So that's a real small number, you know, 0.1%. Don't care about that at all. So what this means is that, in fact, the electron polarization drift is quite small. Uh, namely because it's of order omega 1 over omega CE, and, and that's, uh, you know, primarily, well, and that's quite small compared to the 1 over omega CI term. So our polarization drift is then mostly carried, it turns out, by the ions. So it's NI, QI, V polarization ions. So if I have an oscillate, oh, maybe I should, I'm sorry, I should have said up here at the first, why are we doing this, so to speak? Uh, if I was going to calculate a dielectric constant, what I would do is I'd go in and I'd jiggle the medium, and I'd like to find its polarization. So I'd jiggle the medium. I'd put on an electric field, oscillate it or something or other, and watch the response of the plasma. What the polarization drift does is it, it, it is the response of the plasma to a time-varying electric field. And what we're finding is that the current that produces is primarily due to the ions, basically because if you look at their orbits, as Chen explains, um, they get bigger effects uh, because of the time scale, um, because the cyclotron frequency takes so long um, compared to the electrons, which are gyrating very rapidly. So it's primarily the ions that respond to a, an electric field perpendicular to the magnetic field in this uh, polarization sense. So that in mind, let's now use this to try to calculate a dielectric constant. So use polarization current to calculate dielectric constant. And how do we do that? Well, we use Maxwell's equations, and we say that J is equal to J free, a few free charges, plus the polarization current. And so we use Ampere's law, curl B is equal to mu naught J plus epsilon naught dE dt. Um, and then what we do is we write in that the J that belongs in here is a combination of this polarization current in the plasma because I applied an oscillating electric field. So this becomes mu naught J free plus now I've got J polarization and then finally I've got this plus epsilon naught dE dt. Now, Maxwell's equations, um, you remember our dielectric constant form would have said that the combination of those two terms should in fact be d d by dt. Um, perhaps also I should kind of keep in mind that this polarization is a, is a perpendicular process. It was, it was only a response to a perpendicular electric field. Parallel electric field was a rather different thing. So let's uh, put a few. This was surely a perp back here. So that's, it's basically all um, perp. Perp, perp, well, perp. Just stick in a few perps to make it hard to read. Um, okay, so what we're then, what we see out of this 
is that if I was to define D is equal to epsilon E, and epsilon is then the total dielectric constant, which actually we're only talking about perpendicular to the equilibrium magnetic fields here, so that's perpendicular E, then what I should say is that this epsilon naught is equal to, um, or I'm sorry, epsilon is equal to epsilon naught plus, and now don't worry about the kind of directionality of things here. I'll divide one vector by another, which I can't really do, but we're choosing the vectors are actually in the same direction, so it doesn't, it's okay. Um, so it's J polarization over uh, the epsilon perp dt. But we had an expression uh, for the polarization current, which I now see we didn't work out too much. So I need to go back a little bit here. So let's call this 10 prime for my records anyway. Um, namely, we had the polarization drift perpendicular was approximately equal to Ni Qi times the polarization um, uh, flow velocity, and that was 1 over omega Ci and then d by dt of E naught perpendicular over B. Equilibrium magnetic field doesn't vary here for simplicity. But omega Ci we can write out, so that's Ni Qi divided by Qb over M is the magnetic field, or I'm sorry, is the cyclotron frequency. And then we'll also take a, the B naught um, outside the d by dt. Um, so what we're left with then is uh, d by dt of uh, E naught perp. And now this then has the virtue that I knock out those. <laughs> Get the right thing here. Uh, and then we're left with um, just Ni Mi over B naught squared times d by dt of E naught perp. What does the product Ni Mi mean? Well, that's the density of particles times their mass, so it's what we often call the mass density, right? Ni Mi. By the way, in a plasma, I might add Ne Me. But, you know, the electron density is about equal to the ion density. The electron mass is down by 1,836, so we just neglect it. Yeah, okay, small. So we often write this polarization drift then as rho mass over B naught squared, D E naught perpendicular by DT. So that was my sidelight for a moment. The comment then is if I come back and utilize that in my expression here for my dielectric constant, this then becomes epsilon naught, well, sorry, I'm going to move on across here for a moment, epsilon naught plus rho mass mass density over B naught squared times d by dt of E naught perpendicular, but then it's divided by d by dt E naught perpendicular. By the way, what's the difference between cap, uh, you know, d by dt upstairs and the d by dt downstairs? Well, the one downstairs is really a partial derivative, means at a particular point in space. The one upstairs is really a convective derivative, which means it's partial with respect to t plus flow dot gradient, you know, convective derivative. But pragmatically, uh, for our usual simple sort of situations, uh, we don't worry about flow dot gradient yet, so we'll, we won't worry about that. So uh, this is sort of 1 plus uh, rho mass B naught squared. Uh, we'd like to normalize this to the dielectric constant of free space, epsilon naught. So what we'll make this is 1 plus rho mass divided by epsilon naught B naught squared. And what's that? How about unrecognizable? Well, we can make it recognizable by remembering a subsidiary fact that epsilon naught mu naught is equal to 1 over c squared. Okay. 
say, property of uh, vacuum, okay? And uh, what that means is that what we can do is write that our epsilon perp is then equal to epsilon naught times 1 plus mu naught rho mass over b naught squared. And then we're left with a 1 over epsilon naught mu naught. But that is just c squared. And so if that's c squared, then the rest of this it better have the units of 1 over a velocity squared. I mean, you know, if, if I haven't done something wrong, which is always possible, but, uh, you know, check this beforehand so we'll, we'll be okay. And in particular, this is called the Alphane speed. And so what people usually write is that the Alphane speed is B naught over mu naught rho mass, which I could also write as B naught over square root of mu naught ni, mi. This is the so-called Alphane speed. Oops, we're running down here. Now, uh, how big is this Alphane speed? Or in particular, how big is, is this constant here? Is this, you know, the dielectric constant is one, one plus a small number or a little bit different? You know, um, so how big is um, actually what I want to do is c squared over v alphane squared. Well, I need some numbers, okay? And uh, of course, my traditional numbers is, are that I take b is equal to one tesla and an ion density of uh, ten to the nineteenth, okay? And what I then need to compute, and I'll compute it back in, in this form here, is I need to compute mu naught rho mass over b naught squared uh, all times c squared. And what's mu naught? Well, good, everybody remembers it. 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th, or if you're like me and you can't quite remember it, it's in that uh, guide, okay? Uh, ion density I chose was uh, uh, 10 to the 19th per cubic meter. Advantage of MKS, of course, is I don't really have to worry about the units. They'll all come out right in the wash. Uh, the uh, ion mass, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. B naught squared, 1 tesla squared. C squared, 3 times 10 to the 8th squared. And uh, as usual, you know, I, you just go through all this. It turns out this number for this t particular set of numbers is about 2,100. It's almost my ion to electron mass ratio, 2,000. And that's, you know, we'll give that a three units worth of inequality here. That's a big number, right? So what that says is that if I apply, so again, what we're doing is we're saying d perp um, epsilon perp, E perp, if I apply an electric field perpendicular to the magnetic field, the dielectric constant is actually one heck of a lot larger than one, than the dielectric constant of free space. Rather, it's about 2,000 times larger than that. So what this means is when I start shaking the field lines, uh, as in a, f a fluctuation, a wave, or something like that, there's going to be a big dielectric constant, a big inertia uh, associated with that process. What does this kind of um, mean? Uh, or how does it come about? Or how can we kind of interpret it? Well, as a subsidiary comment, let, let me just, uh, um, uh, no, let's say, just notice that. Suppose I ask for the ratio of the gyro radius to the Debye length. Remember, the gyro radius was how big the orbit is as I move around a field line, and a Debye length is my Debye shielding distance over which the plasma tends to shield out charges from being seen by other charges. 
Well, that would be V thermal squared over omega C squared. The Debye length squared turns out to be V thermal squared over plasma frequency squared. And the V thermal squareds cancel. And so this turns out to be omega P squared over omega C squared. Omega, and I'll do it for ions here. Uh, um, should have done it all for ions. Omega PI squared is then NI QI squared uh, over MI epsilon naught. Omega CI squared is QI squared B squared over MI squared. And so canceling off some things here, what we find is that this is simply NI MI over epsilon naught B squared. And that's something we've seen before. Namely, this is our mass density, NI MI. And uh, we'll put a mu naught in here for good measure. And then B naught squared. And this becomes 1 over mu naught epsilon naught. And this is the factor that we had before was our upstairs C squared. And this factor becomes rho mass over B naught squared. Uh, sorry, with a mu naught in front. And so the net result of this is that uh, this is then mu naught rho mass uh, over B squared times C squared. So some of the various ways that we can write the perpendicular dielectric constant then is it's 1 plus C squared over V alpha N squared or it's 1 plus ion gyro radius squared over the ion Debye length squared or it's 1 plus omega P squared, omega PI squared over omega CI squared. This middle one gives us a little bit of a hint of what's going on because if I imagine that I have a magnetic field here and maybe I have Debye shielding over very short distances, okay? But if my particles are gyrating with a gyro, sorry, a, a gyro radius rho, that is much greater than the Debye length, then you can see that I'm going to get an enhancement of the, an, an increase in the, um, uh, in the dielectric constant, an amplification of the dielectric constant, just because my ion gyro radii are much greater than my ion Debye length. So, as a, um, so the basic idea is that this polarization drift is a good example of how one calculates uh, a dielectric constant. Namely, what we required was some plasma model, which in this case was that the ions carry the polarization drift, and they all carry the same polarization drift. You add it together, and you get a net dielectric constant, which under the conditions omega much less than omega C and K perp rho much less than one, uh, small low meridius low frequency is indeed the dielectric constant. Next time we'll talk in much greater detail about the density conservation equation, the momentum conservation equation, and parallel and perpendicular to a field line, what those kind of equations mean.